I had a hunch that people would show up. So, but for the sake of the people on the live stream who've, who've been with us, uh, we'll go ahead and get started, and I guess for our own sake too. Uh, what did we hear about in the reading, the gospel reading on Sunday? Do you guys remember? Mm. Yeah, Jesus said, you know, a little while and you won't see me, and again a little while and you will see me. Uh, and then I, I think I, I tended to focus on in the sermon you know, that Jesus said, you will have sorrow now, uh, but the world will rejoice. Um, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and uh, your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. You know, Jesus foretelling that you know, when he is crucified and died, the, the world is going to rejoice, and, and the disciples are going to be filled with sorrow, uh, but he will soon take away that sorrow. Uh, and we, we find that pattern also in our lives, that uh, we are filled with sadness and, and with sorrow now, but uh, when Christ returns, uh, all of that sorrow will, will go away. Um, and we'll hear some of that mentioned here in the prayer. So this is the prayer for the fourth Sunday of Easter. Uh, let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, who in your fatherly goodness are pleased to chasten your children on earth with a rod of discipline, that we may be conformed to the likeness of your only begotten Son in both present suffering and future glory. We beseech you to comfort us with your Holy Spirit in tribulation and cross, that we may not despair, but cling firmly to this comfort, according to the promise of your Son, that our suffering will be but little, and then shall follow eternal joy that by such hope we may patiently overcome all misfortune and through Jesus Christ obtain salvation. To the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Uh, and see, this is something we talk about all the time, and, and particularly as Lutherans, uh, that uh, you know, the Lord does uh, allow us to, to suffer to an extent that he, he uses our suffering uh, on the one hand to, to discipline us, but also then to to uh, sharpen our faith, uh, and then, of course, he brings us out of this suffering. And, and there's a large chunk of Christianity that doesn't like to talk about suffering, you know, and I, I think that only does spiritual harm, right? Uh, you know, that if we, if we never talk about suffering and we never talk about maybe how to suffer as a Christian, you know, and we grow up this way, then what happens when suffering comes is people jettison their faith or they have some sort of crisis of faith. Right? Uh, so we want to be well catechized and prepared so that uh, when we face suffering, uh, it doesn't surprise us, you know, if that makes any sense. Uh, today, we are going to go on to Judgment Day. So we're going to start a new lesson. So I'm going to hand these out to you guys. Uh, we have Judgment Day, and then the next lesson after this one is uh, Heaven and Hell. And that is the last one in, the, in this series. And I've got a whole bunch extra, so uh, when we continue in June, we'll, we'll pick up from where we left off today. Um, I did look more into... Last week we went on this big field trip about the, the witch at Endor and uh, whether it really was Samuel um, that she conjured. And I, and I happened to look up in our... We have a Concordia commentary on 1 Samuel, uh, and it was written by Dr. Steinman, uh, who is an Old Testament professor and, and Hebrew professor at our seminary in St. Louis. Um, and he kind of gives the rundown of, and, I, and I'm apt to believe him, uh, is that it, it is not Samuel that, get, that gets conjured up, that gets brought up. It, uh, the only one who identifies him uh, as Samuel is Saul. Uh, the, the woman never says that it's Samuel, and this, this alleged spirit never says that I am Samuel. Uh, but the biggest reason, uh, and Dr. Steinman gives a number of these, a number of reasons why, uh, is the biggest reason for me is, uh, what is the mark of a false prophet? 
Let's go to the Bible. Maybe we can find this. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, I think is, is what this is. This is Deuteronomy 18. It's the same passage where Moses talks about the Lord will raise up for you a prophet Is it Deuteronomy 18? I'm, I'm looking at for... Yeah, I'm wondering if it's that passage or not. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Deuteronomy 18. It, it follows... Uh, after this new prophet like Moses. So this is Deuteronomy 18, beginning in verse 15, uh, which we hear in the church here uh, in Advent, I think. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him that you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly. And you said... Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord spoke to me. They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. As in, uh, if a prophet makes a prediction that he says is from the Lord and it does not come true, that is not a true prophet. That is a false prophet. Uh, and in the case of this uh, alleged Samuel, uh, what he says to Saul doesn't come true. Uh, it's not true. Uh, he, he says that t tomorrow uh, you saw and all Israel be handed over the Philistines, and that, that doesn't happen. Uh, uh, you know, Saul doesn't die uh, by the Philistines until two days after that, and he doesn't die from the Philistines, he kills himself. Uh, and even then, uh, it's only his body that gets captured by the Philistines, but only for a short time. Uh, also, Saul's sons don't die, which is what Samuel says. He says, tomorrow you and your sons are going to die. Uh, Saul's sons don't die until much later. Um, and there's a few other reasons, a um, few other things that Sam this alleged Samuel says um, that don't happen. You know, uh, so that, for me, is, is the big one, is that this, this alleged Samuel, uh, what he says it does not come true. Right? Um, but we do know from earlier in the book uh, that Saul was tormented by evil spirits. Uh, and so it is likely, Dr. Steinman argues, that, that this, was, you know, this was another deception uh, of a spirit, claiming to be Samuel. Uh, and the end result was that Saul didn't repent, but he, he ended up despairing and, and killing himself, which is what, I guess, this evil spirit wanted. So... Anyway, but that has bearing on this lesson. We'll actually come back to this a little bit. So uh, let's turn to our, our lesson. And this particular one is called Judgment Day. And there's a poem from Michael Wigglesworth, who I've never heard of, but apparently he was a Puritan. And it says, The mighty word of this great Lord link body and soul together, both of the just and the unjust, to part no more forever. Uh, the poet Michael Wigglesworth, in his poem, The Day of Doom. It says, as a Puritan, Michael Wigglesworth placed special emphasis on Judgment Day. 
The title of his poem, The Day of Doom, shows the anxiety that many Puritans felt about the return of Christ, an anxiety still reflected in people's obsession with the end times today. We have already learned in previous studies that Christ will return to raise the dead. Then all people will face final judgment. Many in our society would agree that they will stand before God after death and be judged. Uh, and so we have our first question here. What do people commonly think about the purpose of the, I guess, the last judgment, the final judgment? What, what, what do people, when they think about Judgment Day, what, what is the purpose of Judgment Day, you think? Okay, yeah. Yeah, like what is the purpose of this, right? Like what, when people think about judgment, uh, what is the purpose of Judgment Day do people think about? Um, or do people not think that far ahead? I don't know. Yeah, separating the good from the bad, you know. Um, some, like the Puritans, would probably emphasize the, uh, the punishment of evildoers. You know, the Judgment Day is, uh, in their mind, primarily for punishment, you know, uh, as opposed to, well, uh, yes, the, the, the evil and the unjust will be forever put away, but then uh, those who believe in Christ go into the new creation. So they're all, there is a positive aspect of, of Judgment Day, uh, but sometimes when we think about it, you know, uh, it's thought in terms of, you know, punishment primarily. Like, uh, in a lot of, like, movies, and even in real life, uh, it's, you know, sometimes there'll be graffiti on, on walls of the end is nigh, right? Uh, you know, this idea of Judgment Day is going to come and, uh, you know, God's going to get the evildoers. You know, Johnny Cash sang a song that was called... Uh, when the Man Comes Around was the name of this Johnny Cash song, and that was kind of the emphasis of the music was that God was going to come and he was going to punish all those evildoers. So don't be an evildoer, you know, <laughs> I guess is kind of what that emphasis is. You know. uh, so what do people think? Well, uh, the separating of the good from, from the evil, that, that's true. Uh, heaven and hell, many people think about that. Uh, now our next question says, how do people think that they will successfully gain favor during this judgment? Hmm. So how do people think that they will have a good outcome? You, are you thinking of the sheep and the goats? Yeah. Lord, no, well, Jesus says not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Right, uh, But when people think about Judgment Day and they think about, okay, he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff, you know, the good from the evil, how do they think that they will fare, fare well in the judgment? Ah. Yeah, I haven't murdered anybody, you know, uh, right? That you know, when people think about, if they believe in a sort of Judgment Day, this separation of, of good and bad... You know, uh, sometimes the, the idea is that, well, if the good things you do outweigh the bad things you have done, you know, then you're going to get to go in, right? Is, is that kind of, I think that's probably what people think of, is like, well, I haven't, you know, sure, I've cheated on my taxes, but I haven't killed anyone, so, you know. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, you know, when I was a kid, we used to get these, uh, like police magazines and like police supply magazines because my, my dad was a cop and my brother one of my brothers is and uh, I always remember seeing this t-shirt uh, and uh, I don't know on the back of the t-shirt it says bomb squad uh, if you see me running try to keep up you know and uh, you know or a similar phrase was like uh, you know uh, you don't have to be faster than the bear you just have to be faster than you know the person behind you you know, so that the idea of, you know, you don't have to be good, you just got to be better than bad, I, I guess. But people, when they think about judgment day and faring well, they tend to think of, well, 
Uh, if you're a good person, you go to heaven. Uh, if you're a bad person, well, you go to the other place. You know, maybe. But what are they missing? Jesus, missing faith, but also, how do you measure what is good and what is bad? Who, who sets the standard? Like when you say, well, if I've done enough good, I'll go to heaven. By what standard are you measuring? True, true. You know, but if you want to try and make it to heaven on your own righteousness, what does God demand? Does he demand that your good outweigh your bad? Be ye perfect, is the King James, right? You know, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That comes from the Sermon on the Mount. That uh, if you want to try and make it by your own good works, uh, God has set a standard, and the standard is no mess-ups ever. You know, uh, as James says, uh, one who has failed in one part of the law has failed in the, all of it, right? You know, so if you think that you're going to fare well on Judgment Day uh, based on your good work, well, you're, you're missing the fact that God's demands are different than, than what, what we think, you know? Uh, you know, but, you know, from a civil level, yes, some people are, you know, good more than others. You know, there are people who are, are criminals and impenitent criminals, and there are people who are good, upstanding citizens on the outside. We, we don't deny that, that there's difference between people in an outward sense. Uh, but what avails us in the judgment uh, is not whether our good works outweigh our bad, in that sense. You know, and so people who think about it that way, well, you're missing, you're missing the kind of, well, what the standard is. All right? Uh, so... Now it says, to, to shift gears a little bit, uh, Christians have always maintained that death is not the end of existence. Right? You, you just about can't be a Christian without acknowledging that. You know? uh, when we learn the New Testament in Sunday school or in confirmation class, we talk about the Sadducees, right? You know, the Pharisees were lay people, you know, uh, the Sadducees were the clergy. And one of the mar marks of the Sadducees was that they didn't believe in heaven or hell or miracles or angels or any of that stuff. And that kind of befuddles us. Uh, so as a Christian, we, we acknowledge that death is not the end. Uh, so our question here is, well, what is yet in store for all people. And it has us go to John 5 and 1 Thessalonians 4. Okay. John 5, 28 to 29. It's Jesus talking. All right. Let's start at verse 25, just for fun. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Now here's our verses. Uh, Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. All right, and then 1 Thessalonians 4. Sixteen and seventeen, which is a, we've gone to this passage before, so it'll be familiar. Start at verse thirteen, just for fun. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, 
above those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to be, meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So our, our question is, uh, what still is ahead of us after death? Judgment Day, uh, the, the resurrection, you know, these two go together, uh, you know, entrance into the new heavens and, and the new earth, you know, so there is uh, stuff that happens, you know, after death, right? Uh, I always think of, um, what was it, 1999 or so, uh, a movie came out called The Mummy, you know, and uh the, the premise of, of, of the movie is that uh, this guy has, I don't know, an affair with Pharaoh's wife or something like that, and so as punishment, they, they bury him alive. And uh, when archaeologists find the sarcophagus, that, you know, well, they, the, story, the story goes they bury this guy alive and they curse him to, you know, whatever. Um, he comes back and is a monster, you know, but when they find his sarcophagus, he's scratched on the inside that death is only the beginning. You know, and, and you know, ominously, but uh, he's not wrong. You know, de death is not, you know, not the end. What awaits us is, well, the resurrection, uh, what awaits judgment. Uh, but what happens in between? You know, that, that is a wonder for many. That, that's the next question that, you know, uh, after we die later on is going to come the return of Christ, uh, the judgment, the, the new heavens and new earth. Uh, but what happens in between? And that's our next question. It says, many have wondered what happens to believers between the, the day of their death and their resurrection. And it says, look at Luke 23 and then 2 Corinthians 5. Luke 23. We know this one. Jesus is on the cross, and you know there are those two other guys that are up there with him. Twenty-three. Yes. Yeah. So let's uh, read it here. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, "Are you not the Christ?" Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, Jesus, said to him, Truly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Right? Uh, and then 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. Start at verse 6. Uh, so we are always of good courage... We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Right? Uh, so that was our verse. Uh, we are of good courage, uh, we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. I think another passage we could go to, it's not listed here, but uh, Philippians. Is it chapter 1? 
Yeah. Philippians chapter 1. Uh, beginning at, I guess, the second part of verse 18. Paul says, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Uh, Paul's imprisonment. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Right? So our question is, well, what happens uh, to a believer in between uh, death and then the judgment? Well, Doris, you were on to that already. And then Pam, were you raising your hand? Oh, I just saw you out of the corner of my eye. Doris, you were on that already. What did Jesus say to the thief on the cross? Yeah. yeah, that you will be with me in paradise. Paul says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ. You know, uh, to the Corinthians, he says, uh, uh, when we are away from the body. Yes. 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 Uh, what death is, to be, to be specific, uh, as far as the Bible is concerned, uh, death is the separation of the soul from the body. Right? Uh, we're not dealing with... Uh, you know, medical death, right? That, that there is a terminology of medical death, you know? There's, a, there's, there's brain death, right? Where they, where they say that a, uh, allegedly a person's brain is kaput. You know, there's, there's been times when they've been wrong, right? Uh, there was one time my grandpa's dog was terrified of thunder and he was at a gas station and it was storming and the, he was inside, I don't know, getting some beef jerky or something and the dog... There was a clap of thunder, and the dog uh, broke through a window, took off. He got hit by a car, uh, and he had a microchip, right? So they, they were able to get a hold of my grandpa, and you know, he got scooped up by a vet or whatnot, animal controls. And they, they called my grandpa to come and say, well, your dog's al alive, but his brain is done for. It. You know, why don't you come say goodbye? Uh, and he got there, and Penny, the dog, Lifted up his head, saw my grandpa, he got off the table and, and left, you know. And so we're like, well, there's no change. That dog was not a genius to be, the dog was not a genius to begin with. Uh, but there's been times with people where, where they have been wrong, right? So, but there is this terminology of, of, of brain death, and then there is this, like, medical idea of death, of your, your, your body can no longer can sustain life in, in, in any case, but... Uh, for us as Christians, we, we define death as, as God does in Scripture. Uh, the death is the, the separation of, of the soul from the body. Uh, and at the time of death, uh, as Jesus said to the thief on the cross, or St. Paul says to the Corinthians and to the Philippians, uh, the souls of believers are immediately in the presence of Christ. You know, our, our bodies, yes, you know, are buried, uh, but our souls... Uh, go to heaven to, to be with Christ, to be with the souls of the, the Christians who have gone before us. Uh, we also have this picture uh, in Revelation, you know, of, of the saints uh, in heaven, uh, though not yet in their bodies, uh, are very much alive, right? Uh, there's a, a few hymns along these lines. Let's see if I can find it. There's one in particular that I'm thinking of. Is it, uh, I'm trying to find a, a specific hymn. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to find it. 
Oh, well, here's one uh, that we can do. Uh, 594. I mean, there's a number of hymns that we could go to, but this one, uh... yeah, we sang it not too long ago, did we? Yep. Uh, 4, stanza 4. Death, you cannot end my gladness. I am baptized into Christ. When I die, I leave all sadness to inherit paradise. You see, there's that language of, of Jesus in Luke 23. Uh, Though I lie in dust and ashes in you know, my body... Uh, faith, assurance brightly flashes. Baptism has the strength divine to make life immortal mine. You know, uh, there is nothing worth comparing to this lifelong comfort sure. Open-eyed, my grave is stare, staring. Even there, I'll sleep secure. Though my flesh awaits its raising, still my soul continues praising. I am baptized into Christ. I'm a child of paradise. Right? Uh, there it comes right out that... Uh, you know, that uh, after we die, you know, our soul continues. Uh, I think the hymn I was thinking of was uh, 759. Uh, and even 758. Uh, the will of God is always best. 758, the last stanza says, When life's brief course on earth is run, and I this world am leaving, grant me to say your will be done, your faithful word believing. My dearest friend, I now commend my soul into your keeping from sin and hell and death as well by you the victory reaping. Right? Uh, 759, uh, this body in the grave we lay there to await that solemn day when God himself shall bid it rise to mount triumphant to the skies. And so to earth we now entrust what came from dust and turns to dust and from the dust shall rise that day in glorious triumph or decay. Here we go. The soul forever lives with God, who freely hath his grace bestowed, and through his Son redeemed it here from every sin, from every fear. Right? Uh, so again, this idea of uh, putting Scripture uh, to, to song and confessing, yeah, the, the soul continues after death. Uh, when a Christian dies... We go to heaven, not purgatory. Even though purgatory is on the way to heaven, technically speaking. Right. Now, compared to Scripture passages uh, at speaking about what happens to the Christian, um, there are fewer passages that talk about what happens to an unbeliever you know, right after they die. Uh, one example that we would go to, you know, it's a parable, and we'll hear it in June, uh, the rich man and Lazarus, right? Uh, so that's Luke 16. Why don't we turn to that? Luke 16. I think it begins in verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Right? Uh, so we believe from here, uh, there's a, a couple other passages. Um, 1 Peter 3. 19, I think, is the passage. 1 Peter 3. 
What does that say? Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, uh, because they formerly did not obey. Right? Uh, so there are relatively fewer passages about what happens to unbelievers, but uh, it seems to be the witness of, of Christ and, and Luke and Peter here uh, that the souls of those who die apart from faith, uh, they, they go to, to prison uh, or to hell, as Peter says. To, Christ says Hades you know, is the Greek word for hell, um, that they go there to be uh, tormented and to await the resurrection and, and final judgment. Um, the scripture speaks about this relatively less than the souls of believers. It also is a parable. Yeah, it also is a parable. Yeah. Yeah, if somebody wanted to object to it because it's a parable, that's fine. Um, I think there are other passages in the Gospels in particular where Jesus does talk about hell. Um, but it's a good illustration. But the thing with parables is not, uh, not everything is the point of the parable. So I think... Uh, that the rich man being able to talk, being able to talk to Abraham, uh, whether that's possible, we don't. I guess, I guess we wouldn't know. Um, but it does make for a good uh, literary, you know, aspect of of the parable. Um, I was just talking about this with somebody the other day. You know, the the parable of the wedding feast, right, where. Uh, the, the king throws a wedding feast for his son and they call those who are invited and they all make excuses and don't come. So then he sends out his servants and says, you know, go ahead and grab anyone you can see, both good and bad, that my wedding hall may be filled. You know? And the parable goes that then later the king comes in to enjoy the party, right? Uh, and uh, some commentators say that it, it was customary in this time because most people were poor uh, that if you were invited to something like a wedding feast, they would give you something to wear, something nice to wear, right? Uh, so the king comes in, and he sees this guy not wearing the wedding garment and then, then gets kicked out, right? And typically when we preach on that text, we talk about the wedding garment as uh, faith in Christ, um, baptism, you know, these sorts of, of things. But then people kind of go off on, well... If the wedding garment represents faith or your baptism or, or whatever, and the wedding hall is heaven, how is there a guy in heaven who doesn't have faith? And then we go, well, it's a parable, and not every detail is the point of the parable, right? Uh, and so with the chasm between the rich man and Abraham, uh, is that one of those things? I, I don't know, maybe. Uh, but then Peter also witnesses that uh, the people who did not uh, listen to God's word through Noah before the flood, they, they died and went to the prison. You know, so then that's not a parable. That, that is a straight text from, from the Holy Spirit through Peter. So I mean, you know, that kind of takes away some wiggle room there. Uh, the souls of believers go to heaven. Uh, the souls of, of those who do not believe go to uh, what Christ calls Hades or, or hell. Uh, which is not a good place. You know, uh, this would be contrary to like, um, well, the Jehovah's Witnesses aren't Christians, uh, but they believe in ancient heresy that was called uh, annihilationism, uh, which says that um, if somebody was not a Christian, when they die, they just don't exist anymore. That's yeah, that's it. When they die, they just, they just don't exist anymore. No. That's why it's called annihilationism. They're, they're, just, they're just destroyed. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in God, so, well, at least as far as the scriptures are concerned, because they, yeah, they don't, they don't believe in the Trinity. So, uh, but, uh, but that idea has crept into Christianity. You know, if you were to ask somebody, what happens if somebody dies and they weren't a believer in Christ? Do you get an answer? Or maybe you've never had these conversations, but 
I, I think if you were to ask somebody who uh, maybe wasn't as well catechized as the Lord has granted us to be, you know, they might not have an answer. Or they might not want to say, you know, well, somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus, they go to hell. That is hard to say that. It is hard to say that, you know. Uh, we, we are able to say this because we, uh, by the Holy Spirit. What? No, because... Well, yeah, there is that. that. We'll say that's an asterisk, uh, that we don't personally know, you know, like, say, I'll, I'll use the kind of the flagrant one, Hitler, you know, or Judas, or, or you, you know, we're using this kind of hyperbolic examples. You know, people like to argue whether... Judas or, or Hitler is in hell, or, or insert anybody there. We don't know, because that's, that's outside of Scripture. We don't know uh, if there, there was repentance uh, before death. We, we, we don't know. Um, and so that's different than saying uh, the witness of Scripture is that if somebody dies in unbelief, they go to hell. That's not judging. It's saying, well, this, this is what the Bible says. It's different if you, go, if you go to a funeral and be like, oh, man, I really wish that guy would have been a Christian because he's in hell now. That, that's different. You know, that, then we enter into the, into the realm of judgment, right? Or saying, you know, uh, this person is certainly in hell because of X, Y, Z. Then, then we do enter into judgment. Instead of saying, well, uh, this is what Scripture says, right? Uh, but we also have to go... You know, we can't see in people's hearts, so we do have to go by what we can see from the outside. You know, so the example where this would come into play is um, I, I did have a situation in, in Fairbank uh, a couple years ago, actually, uh, where a woman, um, she was baptized at St. John's as a baby. Um, I don't know if she was ever confirmed, uh, but in between her baptism and when she died, um, she stopped going to church. Um, and, and she died, I think, in her 70s, so had adult children. Um, and the question came to me of, you know, would you have a funeral for this woman since she was, she was baptized at St. John's so long ago? Um, and, and I visited with the children. I was like, I understand that your mother was not a member of any church right now. Um, had she been in the past, as far as my church records are concerned, uh, for some reason after her baptism, we really don't ever see her again. Um, did you ever know your mom to, to have gone to church? No. You know, their, their whole, whole adult lives, they ne their, their child life, they, they never went to church. Their mother never went to church. You know, and so then I had to say, well, I, I can't, see in, into, your, into your mother's heart, but it, it seems to me that the witness of her life is that um, if she didn't ever go to church ever again, that perhaps she did not believe these things. And a part of my job at a funeral is to get up and say that this person was a believer in Christ. Uh, they, they died. They are in heaven by faith in, in, in Christ, by God's grace. And, and if I can't definitively say that, what can I say? You know, um, and so I ended up not, not doing her funeral. Um, I have done one in the past uh, in North Dakota where there was a gentleman who died. Um, he had been a member. The congregation I served was a dual parish uh, previous to my being there, and um, he was a member at the other congregation. The other ca congregation closed, um, and, and then uh, had closed, and then he died. Um, but he had not been really a faithful member um, prior to that. He, he was a member um, and would show up from time to time, but, but really was kind of known for not being a faithful member uh, for a few reasons. Um, and so then they asked if I would do the funeral, and, and I, I did because he, he was, a, was a member, um, even if you know there, there were some issues. And I had some long conversations with his children about, you know, I, I'm... I'm doing this funeral because he is a member, but I, I understand from the manner of his life uh, that 
uh, there are some questions when it, when it comes to, to what did he believe. You know, and, and I did the funeral, and I said, I, there are certain promises that I would like to make that I, I won't make. There are some promises that I can still make, you know, such as the Lord forgives those who, who are, are penitent. The Lord is merciful and gracious and kind, you know, and that even though we are left with a mystery concerning this specific person, um, there are still things that we can say, you know. Uh, so then, again, I, I also wasn't judging. I'm saying this, this is what the witness of Scripture is. You know, so there's a difference between that and saying, oh, this person is obviously in hell. That would be too far. So I agree, I agree on that. And, uh, but to go the other way, can we confidently say that people are in heaven? Mm, it's not the same answer. Yeah. It's not the same answer because we can't with confidence say this person is obviously in hell because we don't, we don't know. They may have repented. You know, they may have called a pastor for for a pastor in their last hours, and you don't know that. You, you know, things like that. That happens, you know. Um, but in the case of a Christian, somebody dies, they've gone to church their whole lives. You know, they're, they're a faithful member. They, they do believe, you know, they're not just, you know, fill in the pew. They, they, they are Christians. Can we say that they're in heaven? I would say Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, apart from some deathbed recanting of their faith, which, which does happen, but that, that's, I would probably say that's, that would be rare. You know, uh, on the other hand, we can say, well, this person lived their, their life in, in Christ. They, they were baptized, uh, and our going to heaven is not a product of our doing, uh, but it was a result of God's grace through faith in Christ. And insofar as this person had faith in Christ, which everybody can see, well, we know what the result of faith, the end of faith is. It's, it's eternal life. So these are, these are kind of apples and oranges. You know? uh, can you say a person is definitively in hell? Well, well, no. But can you say that they're in heaven? Well, in, insofar as you know, they died in faith, as, as we can see from the outside, then, then yeah, we would say that. Or else we couldn't have funerals. Think about that. Do you ever think that's kind of like a, a ba in the back door there, you know, or else, you know, because that's the whole point of a funeral, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And that's sad. It's sad. You know, especially for Christians who do that. That's sad. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and see, this is something that is, uh, we're entering into the realm of Lutheranism because, you know, uh, if you go to a Roman Catholic funeral, as I had been to recently, there isn't as strong of an emphasis on this person died and is with Christ than, than I would prefer, <laughs> that, that I would like. You know, to even say something explicitly like that, like, like we do in our sermons uh, during funerals, that this person has died, they are with Christ. They rest from their labors. You know, they're awaiting the resurrection. Thing, you know, explicit statements like that were, were absent you know, from the service. And I think that's sad you know, because we, we shouldn't invent things that, that Christ hasn't said, but we also shouldn't call into question things he has said and promises that he has made, right? So it's apples and oranges. Can we say definitively, definitively this person is in hell? Well, well, no, because we don't know. Uh, they may have repented. We can say insofar as somebody uh, died appearing to be an unbeliever and, and not knowing, we can say, well, the witness of Scripture is, is this is what happens to unbelievers. We, we maybe shouldn't apply it to that specific person, but that this is what the Scriptures say. But on the other side, somebody dies in faith, then there is a level of confidence that we can speak with. And so there are different situations. Uh, but I, I think you're right. We do need to be careful on both sides of you know, making ourselves the judge. Because you know, that's, that's really not what we're doing. You know? um, but that gets leveled at us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't know that, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah. Although we appreciate that. Right. You know, we are thankful, however, and this comes up later in this lesson, uh, so we'll come back to this thought, um, that when we are brought to faith in Christ, the Lord, by His grace and mercy, remembers our sins no more. And so when it comes to the last day, you know, and we have the sheep and the goats and whatnot, uh, and there's this recounting of a person's good deeds. For us who are in Christ, the Lord does not count our bad deeds against us because they are forgiven. You know, so when, when uh, he comes to our, our page in the book, he's not going to read off all of the sins that we have committed and then all the good, but only the good. For an unbeliever, their bad deeds will get read against them. For those who are in Christ, despite our many bad deeds, uh, those are forgiven. Right? Uh, th that would be a difference. It's not that uh, Christians are less sinful than unbelievers. You know, that's not true. We, 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 all, we all know that from experience. You know, that uh, the difference between a Christian and an unbeliever is not that Christians are better. <laughs> you know, and some people get this, this assumption, and some people have, have uh, continued this, this perception, and, that, and that's, that's wrong. You know, the difference between a Christian and an unbeliever is a Christian's sins are forgiven. The one who has rejected God's word, their sins are not forgiven. And that's the difference. Pam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What Pam's question, I think, in a nutshell, is uh, when Judgment Day comes, what is the basis of the judgment? Right? Like, what is God judging us on? Uh, and like when we look at the parable of the sheep and the goats, you know, uh, you know, there's this emphasis on on works. Have you done good works or not? Uh, and so there, there's that plays into it. Uh, but we are missing the fact that, and I preached on this on Good Friday, which was here, right over there, um, and I talked about how. When Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, what was his prayer? Do you remember that? Uh, Father, if it be your will, let this what pass from me. Cup. Let this cup pass from me. Uh, and, and what Christ is getting at by saying that word, and when we look in the Old Testament, that uh, primarily... Well, other than Psalm 23, where it's a good thing, my cup overflows, most of the time when the cup comes up in the Old Testament is connected to the cup of God's wrath. God's wrath, his judgment against sin. Uh, and now Christ says that in his death on the cross, he is drinking that cup. That God's wrath, his judgment against sin, has already been rendered against Christ for our sake. That God's judgment against our sin has already been rendered and Christ has already borne the wrath that, that we merit. And so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, the cup of death. Yeah. You know. And Jesus says, Yeah, you're gonna. Yep. Mm. Right. Yeah, context is key. Context is key, you know, which is part of you know why in sermons I mentioned like where where is this what is the sequence that is happening in this text? You know, so like 
last Sunday and this Sunday, I'm going to mention how this is, this is during the Last Supper. You know, Jesus is saying this stuff. You know, this is why the disciples are sorrowful is because they, they're, they're aware that something is going to happen here, right? Uh, so context is key. Uh, but to get back to Pam's question, when, when Christ returns to, to render judgment, yes, all our deeds are written in his book. Uh, but when Christ reads out the sentence, he's going to pass over our, our lawless deeds, to use his own language from Scripture, that uh, what he's going to read out uh, is the good that we have done. He's not going to read out against us the bad. You know. Uh, now, the one thing I've been talking about uh, in this confirmation class at St. John's at times is uh, there is no such thing as uh, planned repentance. You know, planned repentance is like when somebody uh, stops going to church and they figure, well, well, when I'm old, I'll go to church again. You know, later on, I'll repent. You know, um, that doesn't always happen that way. But there's also no such thing as partial repentance, meaning you can be sorry for some of your sins, but not your others. You know, you're either repentant or not. And there may be sins that due to our weakness, we fail to repent of, but that's different than being, you know, I know this sin and I'm not sorry for it. That would be impenitence. You know, so, the, so Pan's question was like, well, what, what about, you know, when he's looking at this, you know, reading his, his judgment against us, you know, or for us in our case, you know, what, what about all those sins I did where I, at the time, I wasn't repentant? Well, you are now, you know, or else you wouldn't be there, you know. Um, and this is kind of scandalous because you can see how the old Adam also kicks around in our hearts because this idea that our bad deeds, our sins are not going to be used against us by faith in Christ, there's part of us that is upset by that, you know, uh, because we want on some level to be judged on our works, which is not what Scripture says. And it's the same thing with, like, deathbed conversions. There's part of us that wants to say, this person was evil their whole lives. How can they go to heaven? There, and there's part of us that, that gets upset by this because we see, like, we have this, like, what we, this so-called righteous indignation instead of saying, thanks be to God, this person was evil their whole lives and the Lord has granted them repentance. We should rejoice. Huh? Yes, we should rejoice. The, you know, the angels in heaven rejoice over one who repents. Right? Instead, we go, oh, you know, you know, all these things. You know? But it's also scandalous on the other side to say, and scandalous in a good way to say, God's judgment against our sin was already rendered by Christ dying on the cross. That God, by his grace, uh, through faith in Christ, has already declare that we are not guilty. And so when we get to the last day, the judgment has already happened. What happens on the last day is this public uh, pronouncement of, of what has already taken place. Because like, if you think about it, the unbelievers at the last day, <laughs> it's not going to surprise them. They're unbelievers. You know, the, the day itself, but as far as like God's judgment against their sin, they, they, they've already been in hell. They already know, you know, this is going to be speaking out loud, you know, the judgment that has already been made, right? Uh, which is another thing, you know, because the, the judgment on the last day, you know, that judgment has already been rendered. You know, it's kind of like, um, oh, confirmation. Uh, coming up at St. John's, uh, hopefully, uh, we're, we're going to have a confirmation, right? Uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, they teach that confirmation is a sacrament, right? That you get this, this special grace, uh, you know, by, by being confirmed. Oh, we're over time, so I'll, I'll try and wrap this up. What does confirmation actually do? <coughs> yeah, in what sense?
Yeah. Yeah, so we speak out loud what has already happened, right? And, and the rite of confirmation, I guess it doesn't really do anything per se, uh, but it's saying out loud what has already taken place, you know? Uh, it's this outward recognition of, of what has already happened. And, and we use this as, you know, okay, now this entrance to, to the Lord's Supper, uh, but uh, really by the time the kid is being confirmed, the good has already happened. You're just saying out loud what has already happened. At the judgment day, it's going to be said out loud what has already happened. That, you know, by faith in Christ, the judgment has already happened. It's already happened. And if somebody dies in unbelief, the, the judgment against them is all, has already happened. Uh, is this going to be like at confirmation, as Doris was putting together there? It's going to be saying out loud what, what has already happened. Right? Uh, now, we are a little bit over, so we should pause here. We will not have Bible study for the next two weeks. And I'll try to make sure to mention this on Sunday. Um, Next week, because I'll be at a conference. Two weeks from now, because we'll be in the Twin Cities. Uh, but then back in, once we get back into June, we'll, we'll hopefully finish this. Or maybe never. Maybe the Lord will return before then. That would be okay, too. But we'll allow it. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we better pause. Lots of good questions today. Thank you, guys, for, um, you know, and challenging stuff, too. You know, this, this Judgment Day, you know, it's, it's not all, you know, what is what say in Hebrews, uh, we're into solid food and not just milk, right? Uh, and so it is, though it is difficult, we should also be thankful uh, for the opportunity to talk about this stuff, you know, that this kind of high-level stuff. Uh, we give thanks that the Lord has brought us to be able to converse like this, you know, and that we're not just talking about Zacchaeus, although talking about Zacchaeus is fun, you know, but that we can talk about other stuff too, so... Uh, but why don't we end with a word of prayer, and then we'll call it a day. Let us pray. Uh, gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you on this warm spring day for the opportunity to be here again in your sanctuary, uh, to study your word and to confess our faith that, yes, uh, someday soon your Son will return to raise the dead and to render judgment. We thank you, Lord, that by your grace uh, that judgment has already been rendered over us, uh, that Christ, for our sake, bore your wrath against our sin on the cross, and that through his death and resurrection, we are reconciled to you. Uh, though we once were your enemies, we are now your own dear children. We ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would keep us in this faith, and that by the same Holy Spirit, you would grant us opportunity to, to confess this before the world, uh, before our neighbors, uh, in such a way that those who have not yet heard the gospel uh, might hear it and so be saved. Let your blessing remain with us this day, that as we go about the work of our vocations, all that we say and do would be pleasing in your sight, and grant also that we might return here on Sunday to again hear your word. In your name we pray. Amen.